The following is chapters 13 to 15 of the audiobook Apocalypse Awakening. It can be listened to by itself, but if you want the full story so far, then please check out the audiobook of Apocalypse Awakening in the link below. 5.52 Ronald wrote down the time as he sat at his desk, eight minutes early to work. He straightened his glasses and put the pen on top of the fresh paper file. He could save money by using his smart gauntlet to write notes like the other guards, but he did not favour that approach. After a few hours, the brightness of the screen's pixels hurt his eyes, and his fingertips, ironically, smarted from the constant tapping on the device's touchscreen. The pen might cause his hand to cramp, but unlike a keyboard, it acted as an extension of his arm flowing across the page and ushering in a wave of calm between the interactions, between the questioning and leering, and the eventual shouting. 5.57 The door behind Ronald swung open and he heard the same daily question. Coffee? He gave the same answer as every morning. No thanks, I have my water. He did not like coffee, a few sips and his hands would start shaking as his head began to pound. Mm, <clears throat> okay. End of conversation. He did not dislike the man, he simply disliked talking in general, and fortunately, Jorge had come to understand that. He hoped that would be all he had to say to Jorge until their shift change. Already knew that would not be the case. There was always some sort of ruckus caused by troublemakers. That was the Lugo apartment's greatest flaw, the only place worth making trouble in for hundreds of kilometres around. Ronald wished the fights would spark off inside the complex, away from his jurisdiction at the gate. Six o'clock. Ronald looked up, through the bulletproof glass panel, to the alcove the security station was built into the side of. The area to the left of the wide double-lane entrance was becoming awash with dull morning light, illuminating the desert and quasi-inhabited town sitting in the middle of it. All caged off by the gate separating the civilised world of security and order from the wastes. The shutters had been replaced with a latisse grille of martesian steel so that the guards could poke their weapon muzzles through the wide, square gaps. There was a queue already on the far side, extra keen to trade, extra keen to steal. It was hard to tell which. Jorge wandered over, next to Ronald, chewing at a coil, a tortilla pocket he must have grabbed from one of the food stands. Jorge nodded to himself as he ran his eye down the line outside, checking that the four guards, the men responsible for the body checks, waited on the apartment side, rifles ready. Jorge shouted to the group, one of them shouted back, and everyone joined in on the laughter. Everyone except Ronald. He was not listening to them, instead checking his pens were lined up in disciplined formation against the page's stenciled perimeter. Slam! Jorge, a little too hard, on the button, gate clattering to life as it pulled itself out of the way of the crowd already pressing forward into the widening, expressionless jaws, filtered down by barriers into one side of its mouth. Ronald checked the time on his gauntlet. 6.02. Two minutes late. He knew it would not be worth raising the point with Jorge, nor with his employer, who had previously said such a small amount of time did not matter. Neither of them appreciated stringent adherence to the rules, no matter how many times he argued in its defence. 6.23 The morning queue was nearly processed, and once everyone was through, there would be a general quiet until approximately 8 o'clock, when the human traffic would pick up again. So far, no issues. There rarely were this early in the morning. A group of men came to the window, Six of them, only their heads visible due to the raised position of the security booth. One designed for looking down on cars, not talking with pedestrians. Ronald began to write furiously, scanning each face between hurried sentences, 
knowing that he only had so much time before this large group would start complaining. Male, number one, clean-shaven, neat brown hair, eyes brown, skin unburnt. This one had no notable facial features, so Ronald glanced to the round mirror in the alcove's far corner, reflecting an image of the man's backs. Wrote down, wearing navy-coloured trench coat. Name? Hawker. He noted the name against the description. Male number two, long ginger beard, short ginger hair, eyes green, skin pale. He supposed the last point fairly obvious for ginger-haired people. Name? Firecrutch. One of the men snickered. Ronald wrote anyway, not caring if it was some made-up nickname. Any answer suited him and the expectant blank spaces on the page. Male number three, clean-shaven, bald, no hair at all, eyes, greenish-brown, skin disfigured with varying colours accompanied by scars. He glanced up. Bandages wrapped around the neck. Hey, are you going to take much longer? There it was, the first angry comment. Ronald ignored the question. Name? Hush. He recorded the name and the peculiar, wispy voice. This is bloody ridiculous. How fucking long is this going to take? Ronald carried on. Male number four. Medium length black beard. Medium length styled black hair. Eyes obscured by reflective sunglasses. Skin tanned. Name? Princess fucking Sunshine. More snickering. For fuck's sake, this is taking the piss. Ronald turned to the shouting man, could feel the sweat beginning to form on his forehead as he tried to ignore the mounting stress. Male number five, slight stubble, bruised face, yellow spiked mohawk, eyes dark brown, skin... Light brown? Tanned brown? Ronald tapped the pen nib on the paper, stuck. Felt the pressure of the man's eyes boring into him, and quickly settled with just brown. Name? You know my fucking name, Ronald. His heart started racing when he heard the growl. Looked down at the paper, not wanting to meet the angry expression. Pretended to write something. None of the other little secretaries waste my time taking this many notes. Only you. And every time we go through the same routine. And every fucking time, I tell you, you best remember me. Cause soon, everyone's going to remember. We got a problem here. Ronald let out a sigh of relief as Jorge stepped to the window. Arms crossed with bulging forearms, moustache set tight against his lips. You there, tell Ronald, the man sent spittle flying against the twelve holes drolled into the window, that he better remember my name, cos next. You know Ron, do you? Then you should know he doesn't like to be shouted at, and I don't like anyone being a disrespectful little shit. Ronald looked up at the grip, saw that the mohawked man stood alone. The men with him had backed off a few paces. The man's eyes turned from an angry snarl to a slacking mask. Well, all I want is a little. You want to be remembered? Well, don't worry, cause I do, Quidel. This isn't the first time you've caused a fuss. Write that down, Ronald, along with a 50 toss coin fee for being disruptive to staff. Ronald jotted the details while Quidel stared back in abject horror. You're not serious. I'm sorry. Want to pay a hundred? Quadell looked around, Mohawk swishing after him. He was greeted by the empty space between him and his companions, who were all looking off in different directions, apart from Princess fucking Sunshine, who smirked back from under his sunglasses. One of the armed guards turned at the commotion, giving Quadell another unfriendly gaze. The man's hostility shriveled, and the tension dissipated with it. He grumbled as he opened his smart gauntlet and swiped upwards, digitally throwing the toss coins towards Jorge's already open gauntlet. Thanking you? Ronald knew Jorge would keep the toss coins for himself, but he did not mind. 
at least the men were moving along now. He made sure not to look at the mohawked man as he stormed off. He had already forgotten his name. That was all right. The page memorized it for him. The last man arrived and offered a broad smile. Male number six. Short beard, fuzzy hair, eyes grey, skin black. Name? Rammer. And don't worry, pal. We won't be causing you too much trouble. The man winked as he sauntered off after the others. Ronald noted the man's denim jacket. Noticed Jorge still standing next to him. Thanks. Jorge tutted. If I'm not wrong, they're part of Sawtooth's crowd. A bunch of fuckers. Not for the first time, Ronald pondered the use of the glass, separating him from the aggressive crowds. Any gun made in the last few decades, with its ammunition successfully smuggled through security, would shatter the thick panels in an instant. Hawker unbuttoned his trench coat and took in a deep, appreciative breath as he entered the cool ground floor of the apartments. The best floor. The market. The line of stalls, stretched into avenues around the car park's pillars, were already coming to life. Flaps furling back, wares being placed on display, stalls simmering and frying delectable-smelling foods. And in the middle of it all were the first customers of the day, grabbing bites to eat and quick essentials before heading off through the apartment's one exit, freed from their curfew. Morning light seeped in from all sides, mingling with the fluorescent bulbs on the ceiling, giving the place a weird, shadowy presence. How he loved to mingle here amongst the small, independent shops, forming the heartbeat of everyday commerce. That four-eyed bastard! Hawker looked back at Quidel, who made sure to keep his voice low as he ranted. A lot easier if none of the subjects of his anger heard him. He should know who I am by now. Everyone who knows what's good for them should. If it wasn't for that moustached fuck, then I'd smash his face in, I would. How interesting. Quidel wasn't cursing the guard who'd actually confronted him. Must be some psychological reason for his choice of blame. Then again, Quidel would probably ruin any study of the mind he took part in. An anomaly for sure. The rest of the group ignored Quidel's raving. He picked up on the blasé attitude towards the injustice done to him. And very courageous of a lot of you, turning your backs in your boss's hour of need. Firecrotch spun around, face going red as his hair. You're no fucking boss of mine. Quidel suddenly looked panicky again, glancing around for help and only receiving a chuckle from Rammer. Your problem, Quidel... Sonny said, still wearing his sunglasses despite the dim of the ground floor. Is that you need to learn when to pick your battles. Getting Malvi at the entrance does no one any good, although it did bring a smile to my face. Sonny certainly wasn't smiling anymore, mouth back to its normal flat line. I like the note-taker, Hush said in that shivering, raspy voice of his. He wasn't surprised at all by my face. Fair point. Not many people could look at that robed nightmare fuel of scars, bandages and burns without feeling queasy. Come on then, Hawker said, joining the circle they had formed by the stairwell. What's the plan, boss? The heavy emphasis on the last word only went unnoticed by Quidel, who beamed. All right, lads. Gather round, he said to the lads already gathered round. Reckon Sawtooth's girlie must have got here last night, and she'll still be here. Couldn't have moved on that quickly before curfew, I tell you. So, we're going to find the girl, and then we'll take her back. Outstanding plan, Hawker sarcastically thought to himself. How are we going to find her? Sonny asked looking like he couldn't care whether he got an answer or not. We'll split up. Hush, you're on the ground floor. Sonny, first floor. Rammer on second, and Firecrotch takes third.
lighting up the sky above, Rammer jeered. Fuck up. Meanwhile, I'll be moving between the basement and all of your floors, checking on you lot. If you find the girl, call the group chat. Did you set one up? Hawker asked. I'll do that while everyone takes position. Make sure to check your gauntlets. And how are we going to remove her? Hush scratched at the bandages around his neck, as if summoning a word longer than three syllables required great effort. Discreetly. Don't worry, Hushy. I have a way. Quiddell reached into his pocket and let slip a piece of cloth before hastily stuffing it back as a group of tattooed men, inked with the marks of some no-man's-land gang, sauntered past. Drugs? Hawker asked in a low voice. That's the plan. Stroll out the front door with an unconscious girl draped over your shoulder. Hawkey, don't assume so quick. Quiddell had used E at the end of his name too seemed to be doing it to everyone he considered beneath him. It is a drug, but don't worry. It'll only make the girl drowsy and stumbly-like. We'll walk her right out the gate with us. I did my research, see? They check us on the way in, but on the way out, barely a glance. Maybe towards people who aren't already on their radar, you irritable moron. Someone else would have to escort the girl out away from the mohawk fin, swimming out of the crowd's surface. Drowsy, eh? Rammer licked his lips. Sounds like we could have some fun with Sawtooth's prized possession before she goes to the riders. Quiddell grinned. I reckon by the end of the day, she'll be able to tell us if Firecrotch lives up to his namesake. Hawker didn't join in on the trio's laughter. Why am I hanging around these sorts again? His business-minded riposte came back instantly. Because they're the easiest bunch of simpletons to sell to north of the apartments. All right, then, Hawker said, clasping his hands together. Let's get this over with. I have an eye on some punters I want to talk to while we're here. Quiddell's hand placed itself on his chest as he made to move. Hawker had to stop himself from smacking the owner. Not so fast, Hawkey. Someone needs to stay here and make sure the girl don't leave. He nodded towards the entrance. Keep an eye out. Guard duty? Hawker asked indignantly. The rest of the group had already turned away, glad not to be assigned the task. No volunteers to swap shift at any stage either. How courteous. Don't worry, Rammer tossed over his shoulder. A slot on the girl won't have too much fun without you. I don't want your kind of fun, you deranged horny creep. And remember not to get distracted. Don't want you trying to hawk anything, hawker, Quiddell guffawed. Hawker spat on the concrete floor as Quiddell and his posse swaggered off, cursing the crap joke and the nickname that had enabled it. He remembered when he used to have the name Hawkeye, Suitable for the man with the best eyesight in the rock. Better than a friggin' fighter pilot's, although he was too tall for that kind of career. And too ambitious. You can't make much money flying kilometres above the customers. But that had been his curse as well. His love for haggling. That initial build-up of the purchase and then the rush of a good sale. He'd pursued that thrill wholeheartedly during the demolition derbies at Sawtooth's Rock building himself a customer base and a reputation to boot. He still remembered the day, boasting in the stands, as two trucks with ridiculously oversized tyres made unsuccessful attempts at bashing the other to pieces. He'd sold some idiot no-man's lander a box of coffee filters, telling him they could clean even a Balfarian's piss into fresh drinking water. Charged 120 toss coins for them too, always memorised a good sale. He had laughed with the rest of the lads as he told the story, before that imbecile, Fuse, blurted out, They shouldn't call you Hawkeye, Hawkeye. They should call you the Hawker. He had spluttered out his iced tea, laughing at such a ridiculous name. Realised, a fresh seconds later, not so many men were laughing with him. 
That's not a bad name, you know. Aye, drop the vivo. He's certainly no hero or hawker. And with that accompanying chorus of laughs, his fate was sealed. That's the trouble with nicknames. You never get to pick your own. And at the Rock, the only men without nicknames, at least to their face, were the disliked type. Like Quidel. Fortunately, he wasn't in the same category as that mohawked psycho. Hawker took position by the entry gates, leaning against a concrete pillar pockmarked with ricochet wounds. And what a pleasant coincidence! From here, he saw down the lengths of both the stalls in front and to his left, goods being flogged on either side of the lanes. Recognised a few of the people on either side of the stalls, especially the duller ones. He only hoped they didn't remember him. He had an easier time selling to new customers, ones he hadn't ripped off. Then again, old customers could be willing to make another transaction to show him they'd learnt from the last time. Reclaim some of their self-respect. For them, a little money came second to the pride at stake. Hawker was fine with that. Their money was much more useful than his pride. He glanced at the gates, entry queue now vacant. Glanced back. Did he really have to stand here, all day, as potential profit fluttered into the hands of less deserving peddlers? 9.45. The line outside heaved and bustled as the lengthening column was herded by the guards, trying to keep some semblance of order amongst the organised criminal types, desert ruffians and poor souls just looking for accommodation or basic supplies at the very least. Men pushed and women yelled as they all boiled under the sun. There used to be a canvas pavilion sheltering the queue, but it had been removed due to the constant fights that broke out as people clung to the precious blocks of shifting shadow. Now there was no shade, and still as many fights. A woman dressed in a frumpy shirt and trousers broke from the line and made a run straight for the gates. One of the guards stepped forward and rammed the butt of his rifle into her stomach, making her collapse and convulse amongst the dirt and jeers. Ronald shook his head. He hadn't appreciated thorough regulation and structure before he saw what happened in its absence. It had all become an all-too-rare resource since the APOC. Behind him, Jorge talked on his smart gauntlet. You say it was a cruiser that passed by? You sure it wasn't some ferry headed to Shankmora? Hmm. Alliance? I doubt they were out this far. Ronald's right hand began to cramp as he finished recording the details of the latest visitors. A man and a woman who walked into the apartments holding hands, a ribbon twined in the woman's hair. A romantic coupling. Weird sight out here. He swapped the pen to his left hand. The writing would not be as neat, although Ronald was becoming better at ambidexterity. It was not a common skill, especially in this digital age, which only made it more appealing to Ronald. All right there, how are we keeping? Ronald studied the new pair of faces. Wrote, male number one, greying goatee, greying short hair, eyes brown, skin pale. He thought of something more distinctive to note. Shirt, floral. Name? Ah, he speaks. It's Billy. Do you need my second as well? Is that bloody Billy Kruver? Jorge had finished his conversation and sauntered over to the window. Don't let him pass, Ronald. He'll only cause mischief once he's inside. Don't listen to him, Ronald, Billy replied, focusing on Jorge. I could rob every man in here and still be less of a nuisance than our Jorge back in the day. You're never going to let that go, are you? And finally let you live a carefree and content life? Not a chance. A pause as the pair glowered at each other from separate sides of the glass. They suddenly burst out laughing, drowning the shouts from the line behind them. Ronald relaxed. Sometimes it took him a while to clock these social contexts. How have you been, Billy? Jorge sat in the chair next to Ronald, a position he rarely bothered to take. Ah, you know, same as usual. Shame the usual part changes on the daily. You're preaching to the choir there, 
Ronald dislodged himself from the conversation and studied Billy's companion. Male number two, clean-shaven, short blonde hair, eyes blue, skin fair. He glanced in the mirror to double-check before writing, Very tall stature with matching frame. Name? Oscar. Deep-voiced, one-worded response, the way he liked it. Seemed Oscar was more akin to himself than the pair of men still talking. Any trouble today? Billy asked. Jorge nodded towards the thrashing line outside. No more than normal. Here, friend, have you heard this? Just got a call from some of my boys. There's reports of an Alliance cruiser in the area. A Stratus class, headed north. That wouldn't have anything to do with your lot, would it? Alliance? Well, someone's been sniffing around our doorstep. Wouldn't be the biggest surprise in the world if it was them. Thought so. I've heard rumours about Arminius's... Jorge trailed off, and to Ronald's surprise, shifted his eyes awkwardly. Billy grimaced. Aye, since it's you, Jorge, I'll admit, the rumours probably aren't far off. That's a real shame. He was a good man. Let's not start using the past tense that quickly. Billy smiled again. There's still hope for him. Good way of looking at things, I suppose. So, what brings you out here? Here to pick up a new recruit, or at least that's what we hope. He's not signed on yet. She isn't. This time, it was the tall man, Oscar, who spoke. But it's been a long time coming. Well, good luck to you, and especially good luck to the woman. God knows, spending time with you lot near caused the death of me more than once. Billy laughed as they walked off. That's what makes it so fun. Jorge chuckled. Be wary, Ronald. With Billy about, it's only a matter of time before the fireworks start. Ronald gave Jorge a critical stare. Was he joking? If that was true, then why let him in? Hawker pocketed the tubes of lip balm back into his trench coat, muttering as his latest failure of a sail waddled into the strip of crowd thronging between the stalls. He had spent half his time trying to act the arms dealer, selling various holsters, stands, and attachable sights, while the other half he spent playing the looky-looky role, offering sunscreen, sunglasses, and even novelty fans to passers-by. Didn't matter to him what he sold, as long as it was in demand. But so far, he'd shifted nothing. An abysmal performance, considering how well he normally did. He blamed it on location, the only place where he could see both the market and the entrance. A crucial factor, location. It really showed how being only five metres away from the established crowd ostracised a man and his decent wares. That was the Lugo apartment's worst flaw. A truly suspicious market base. Although... It wasn't a completely unfounded suspicion. Deregulated markets like this one didn't give much of a damn about fairness. Then again, neither did regulated markets. Hawker chuckled at his own joke. Noticed a haggard woman shoot him a cautious look at his grinning. Not everything's about you, Hawker snarled. Move on before you get in trouble. She spat between his feet and hurried past. It wasn't until Hawker spotted a few angry stares that he realised his mistake. Charmin, someone said, voice dripping in scorn. Bet you're a real hit with the ladies. Hawker twisted around. What did you... He stopped mid-utterance as he was confronted with a derisive look from a man with a goatee and his expressionless blonde body, heads nearly brushing the ceiling. The man's escort made an intimidating package indeed. The two men eyeballed Hawker as they walked by, daring him to finish his sentence. He turned away and offered his own gob of spit to the floor. It was like Sonny said, you had to pick your battles. A prickle of guilt replaced Hawker's subsiding anger. He knew he'd been the one at fault. Living in Salthoof's Rock really did drain a man of chivalry towards the fairer sex. Could he be blamed when he was used to being surrounded by women treated worse than dogs? And now here he was, trying to drag one of them back to the kennel. 12.11 
Ronald pushed the glasses up his glistening nose, sweat dripping despite the fan blowing next to him. A radio played softly behind him, foreign lyrics accompanying the trumpets and viola. Universal translators didn't work on songs. It was something about the lyricism that made it hard to convert the words into the user's language. The queue had quietened, and a steady trickle formed as more people left than entered the complex. The entrance might have calmed down, but it would still be busy inside for hours. Ronald swapped his pen back to his right hand, and looked up at the woman whose head barely reached the window. Young female, brown messy hair, eyes brown and scared. Ronald went back and crossed out the last two words. He did not normally describe visitors' emotional states, but the girl's eyes were so wide and rimmed with white that he had done it automatically. Skin? He guessed she was slightly tanned, although he could not spot a clean patch on her to confirm the fact. Indiscernible due to dirt, potentially several bruises. He checked the mirror, and it took him a moment to discern her clothes through the filth. Wearing shorts, top, sun hat, and backpack. Name? The only response he received were the echoes of sizzling and haggling from the stalls. He glanced up to make sure she had heard him. The young woman just stared back with wide eyes and a quivering lip. Name? More silence. We need your name, dear. Jorge had closed his gauntlet and approached the window, always a keen ear for situations requiring a defter approach that Ronald could manage. Can't let you in without one. Everyone has to be registered. And before you say it, I agree. It's a load of shit. His chuckle filled the silence, followed by more silence. Ronald did not mind gaps in conversation, but Jorge was a different kind of man. Listen, sweetie, we can't let you in without a name. Jorge bent closer to the window, his voice soft. The frightened woman, Ronald guessed she could be no more than twenty, was having quite the effect on the hardened security veteran. Can you not speak? We can't exactly hand you a piece of paper through this window, but if you write out your name on your gauntlet... Oh, you don't have one. Jorge straightened, scratching his head. Is she all alone? Not many folks have parents knocking about these parts. Surely she's travelling with friends. Ronald shrugged. He had been working here for nearly three years, and was no closer to understanding how people from No Man's Land operated. Well, I guess we'll just have to... Emilia. The woman took a step back as they both looked around at the quavering voice. Emilia, she repeated in a louder voice, a smile starting to pull at her sun-dried lips. Is this the same woman that ran at the gate last night? Something ain't right, Jorge muttered under his moustache. You stay right there, Amelia. I'll come out and take you to our staff room. We'll sort you some tomato juice and find where your friends are. Jorge left through the back door as Ronald bent down and recorded the name. Where'd she go? Ronald glanced up to see Jorge standing on the other side of the window, peering around. Ronald shrugged. Did anyone just run past you? Jorge shouted at one of the guards by the entrance. He shook his head. Shit, she must have run inside. Jorge moved into the complex. Ronald did not care where she had gone. His job was done. The details recorded. Well, you could buy that scoop. Hawker paused, glancing at the thermal scoop on the stall to his right, and back to the man, giving him a sympathetic shake of the head. But honestly... Three times magnification isn't going to get you far. Not in an environment as open as a desert. You'll need a minimum of five times magnification. And luckily, that's what I have right here. The thermal capability is another bonus on top of that. The man studied the scope proffered into his hands, eyebrows raised and lips twisted in that inquisitive expression people adopted during a sales pitch to mask their confusion. The stall owner next to them continued to boom. Currency conversion over here! Best rates for digital marks to toss coin! Oh, do I really need that much zoomage? What you really need is a dictionary so you can start using proper words. 
Of course, of course. I mean, you could use three times the zoom, but hmm, that is risking it a bit, especially during these times. But five safer? How the hell should I know? All I know is, there's no way I'm talking up the competition's goods. Before he replied, a voice behind him rasped. Hawker! Damn. An interruption in the middle of a sale was never good. Gave the punters a few more seconds to apply logic to the situation. He turned. What is it, Hush? And what on earth are you holding? Hush showed his brown teeth, but without the assistance of any lips, came short of a smile. Churros! These were going stale, so I got a discount. Here, I have to go. Hawker turned and had the scope thrust back into his arms. The man vanished into the crowd, which had thickened from a few morning dawdlers to a horde of eager shoppers. Peak trading hour. Hawker stuffed the scope back into one of his coat pockets. Damn it, Hush, you scared my customer away. The scars around Hush's teeth were on the verge of cracking as they broadened. My apologies. I forgot to put on any foundation today. Ah, screw it. You don't happen to be in the market for thermal scopes. Right now, all I'm in the market for is Sawtooth's girl. So I have to wonder why you're not keeping eyes on the entrance. I was, all friggin' morning. Do you realise how long I've been standing there for? And not a hint of any runaways. Have a look yourself! Hawker gestured to the entrance, a few stalls length away. Froze, as he saw a young girl, covered head to toe in filth, run past his all-too-familiar pillar. Even through the thin gaps in the crowd, he recognised the girl that Sawtooth had flaunted in front of them countless times, as he boasted how she only got prettier with each passing year. The favourite, dashing right by Hawker's eyes, wide-brimmed hat flying from her head. His mind snapped back to a lazy Saturday before the APOC, waiting indoors all day for his sofa to be delivered, popping out at ten past five to get milk, and coming back to a yellow note. Sorry I missed you. Crap! Hawker spun and rushed towards the entrance. He shoved a dark man draped with necklaces out of the way, dodged a nasty-looking brute riddled with piercings, and scattered a group of chattering ladies as he burst through them. Was the girl not meant to be leaving? Why was she running back into the markets? He hurtled into the open space at the end of the stalls, just as a beefy man appeared to his right, running at a fair pace too. Hawker couldn't stop himself in time, and neither could the beefcake. He slammed into the man with his shoulder, and they both went tumbling, smacking onto the filthy concrete. A chorus of shocked gasps rang out, and a circle cleared around the two of them, floundering on the floor. Hawker rolled onto his back, wheezing and clutching at his side, where the accursed thermal scope had dug into his ribs. Through watery eyes, he recognised the white shirt and black trousers of the man in the booth at the entrance that morning. Hoped he didn't remember him, or the companions he'd been with. The man clambered onto one knee, brushing dirt off his shirt, apparently unhurt. Right then, Hawker wished he had more protective flab of his own. What's the big idea, running around like that? The moustached man accepted a hand from a nearby security guard, as Hush appeared, silent as an apparition. Hawker spotted a sun hat lying on the floor, the one the girl had left behind. He snatched it, stuffing it inside a trench coat pocket before the onlookers noticed. Be ashamed to let a random passerby get their hands on such a valuable item. Thanks for the hand, Hawker grumbled, stumbling to his feet as Hush stood and watched. He rubbed at his side. That's going to bruise. Where'd the girl go? Hush whispered. Or maybe he was just trying to talk like normal. She went, Oi, you two! Mustachio marched over to them as the crowds resumed their flow past the confrontation, bar a few stragglers, wondering if further excitement was to be had. Only now did Hawker see the blaster pistol holstered to the man's belt, and the badge pinned to his chest. Jorge, head security. He'd landed in quite the predicament. Why were you running? 
Hawker wanted to ask the same question. Sorry, Chief. I thought I saw a long-lost love from my past. Couldn't let her slip through my fingers again. Jorge snorted. Next time, just yell. You may not know the rules, but running's not allowed in here to avoid scenarios exactly like this. You're on my radar, so don't be at it again. I'll remember your face next time. He glanced across at Hush. I'll definitely remember yours. Hush's mouth parted once more. Don't I feel special? Sorry again, but we really must get going. Hold it. Hawker stiffened as he wondered how to get out of his situation. The guard that had helped Jorge stood next to him, BR-16, with its iconic curved top guard slung over his back. Hawker had his own pistol, but its payload was in one of the many lockers outside. Live ammunition was forbidden from crossing the Lugo apartment's threshold. Usually, it was a rule he quite favoured. Meant no pissed-off customer from the past could draw on him. Right then, he wasn't such a fan. He heard Hush next to him, rustling for something inside his grey robes. Don't, Hush. If you pull out one of your hidden cleavers, we're both screwed. Jorge's eyes flicked between him and Hush. Did either of you see where that girl went? The one running through here covered with dirt. Hawker looked to Hush, bewildered, then back at the head of security. He didn't know how, but things had become a lot more complicated. The other guard stared down at Hush's hand. Oh, here, give us a churro, would you? She'd done it. She'd said her name. Amelia had always thought it impossible, like trying to fly by jumping from a height, something that would only cause pain. But that hadn't happened. Instead, she felt great. The best rush she'd had since driving out of the rock's gates a lifetime ago. Telling people who she was, why she mattered, like everyone else. Not just some pretty statue to be gawped at. What a joy it was to speak her own name. Amelia darted between the gaps in the shouting crowd and down a line of stalls flanked by shopkeepers selling faded medicine packs, loose electronics, ragged clothes and stacks of trinkets and shiny fake jewellery. She passed a few plates of strange food with scents that made her stomach seize. She wanted to keep running forever, take this giddy feeling of triumph and transform it into glorious, joy-binding movement. She also knew it was time to stop. Now she was on the inside and needed a proper plan. Headache, hunger, burns, bruises and aches. The pain and fatigue of the last few days was beginning to catch up. Amelia slowed to a halt next to a staircase of large concrete steps. There were lots of paintings on the wall here, bubbly words in her own language and others she didn't understand. Drawings of glowing city skylines and green landscapes, scribbles of men and women dressed in rugged attire, with offerings of flowers and two upheld fingers. They were brightly coloured and cartoony, but the strangest thing about the made-up people were their big smiles. No cares or worries. Amelia guessed that's why people drew them. A comfortable sight of what could have been. Or maybe still existed. Chai. Amelia jumped back from the question, reached for her pistol before remembering there was no ammo in it. She spun around and saw a shriveled elderly woman with brown skin and strange colours on her head staring at her. She stood next to a set of large bubbling pots that shook her tiny stall like a witch's collection of cauldrons. Amelia couldn't see any chains or handcuffs on the lady, no men standing to the side keeping an eye on her completely alone. She'd seen women like this one in Shankmora, but she'd never had the chance to speak with them, find out how they managed it. This freedom, when there were so many men around to stomp it out. Chai, the woman croaked again. What a strange word. Maybe it was a secret code amongst the free women. Chai? Amelia repeated. The lady nodded and turned, bustling with the stall and its pots. Was she preparing something to help her? 
A set of heavy booted footsteps thudded down the stairs above Amelia, and she heard a voice that struck her like one of the rock's winter icicles. Inside? Why did she go inside? If you'd been at the entrance like I told you, this wouldn't have happened. It was him. The biggest stain on the desert. The one always there to ruin everything. Amelia saw him now, turning the corner from the stairs above. Mouth twisted, narrowed eyes, scanning the floor from beneath yellow spikes. She couldn't wait for the mysterious chai. The frail woman would be powerless over him. She had to sprint, flee, hide, anything that put distance between her and that monster. Amelia turned and ran. Those idiots had fucked everything. His precious plan had fallen to pieces in an instant. If only he could clone himself like those insurgent fuckheads. That would be the best way to ensure these missions were carried out to the letter. Then people would truly respect the name Quidel. His family and tribe had never respected him, but he'd show them too. He'd go back to the grounds and show each and every corpse exactly how. A woman's shouts rattled his thinkings. Hey, you have to pay for your chai. He turned to look at the commotion. Probably some low-life thief who deserved a... The girl! Despite the caked-on sand and tattered hair, Quirrell still recognised Amelia's slender arms and smoothed legs, shrinking frame slipping into the crowd. One of the prettiest girls in the world. The one he'd brought back to the rock, and the reason sort of had allowed him to stay so close to the core of power for all these years. Had to return her and secure his reign. He sprinted forward, shoving the shouting chai lady out of the way. Amelia had slipped between the mingling shoppers, sliding past legs and skipping around loitering clumps. Quidel was too big to copy her. He pushed the impudent fools out of the way, snarling at disgruntled faces and kneeing the backs of legs. A few tumbled to the ground. A few shouted. He ran on. Let them try and stop him. There was no way he'd let the little brat get away twice. As he detangled himself from the bodies, Quidel glimpsed a flash of dirt-covered leg and a flick of ratty hair whip around the corner of the far stairwell. Fuck. The girl was faster than he remembered. He jogged forward, furiously tapping the Bluetooth earpiece connected to his gauntlet. Now he could talk and run at the same time. Another fantastic precaution he'd foreseen for this very situation. A receiving click. Sammy, the girl's moving to the first floor. Which stairs? I don't know, the one with an exit sign. They all have exit signs, you. Just find her! Quinnell ended the call and started running up the stairs, three at a time. Which stairs? Sonny had asked. What's the plan? Quidel, what do we do? Why did he have to spell out every detail to these disrespectful underlings? His legs burned alongside the glares he was receiving by the time he reached the top of the second step of steps. He stood on the landing, swiveling his eyes between the trucks, vans and buses where the better-off residents slept. Corrugated iron shacks filled the gaps between the bricked-in vehicles and awnings, giving the girl ample room to hide. Then again, it was the middle of a sweltering afternoon, and there weren't many people around for the girl to mingle with. If he hurried, maybe... Well, if it isn't Quidel, the man of the hour. Man of the hour? Quirrell wasn't sure what that meant. Almost sounded like a compliment. He turned to look at the man coming his way. He had a graying goatee and thin hair, but what surprised Quidel was the floral, pastel-coloured shirt and brown shorts he wore like some idiot tourist. He really ought to push this imbecile aside and look for the girl. Although... How do you know my name? Quidel asked making sure to stand straighter and push his shoulders back to remain imposing amongst the squalid setting. Let me tell you, the man replied with his strange accent. I've done my research on all the big players in no man's land, and it would be hard to miss that you're the biggest among them. Billy, by the way. He offered his hand. Quidel gave the outstretched hand a long look. It had been ages since he'd shook anyone's hand. 
the concept alien out here in the sands. He supposed he could go back to old habits for someone who recognised him as a big player. Quidel. I know. Fuck, of course. Someone had finally glimpsed his potential, and here he was making a fucking fool of himself. I wasn't finished, Quidel snapped. My name is Quidel Bonecrusher, starter of fires and conqueror of armies. Really? Billy asked, crossing his hairy arms and making an intrigued face. And how did you get that name? He should really get back to searching, but... I crush bones, Quidel replied. He pointed to the heavy steel warrior boots, which weren't comfortable to wear, but proved important in displaying how awe-inspiring he was. With these, I can break anything under my foot. Hopes, dreams, even... Even bones. All right, mate. Got that bit. I meant how did you get the other name? Quidel hesitated, thrown off by the interruption and the man's dismissive attitude towards his fearsome descriptions. Starter of fires? He asked, cursing himself for how weakly his last words came out. Not sure he was prepared to answer that question. No, no, Billy said, waving to swat the question away. I meant the other one. Conqueror of bullshit armies, Quidel corrected eagerly. This was a speech he'd practiced and iterated to himself many times. One day I will rise. Rise to a height even more formidable than my current one. All beneath who do not serve will quiver in fear at the slightest mention of my name. Like a whisper on the wind, my sheer power will emanate through the air. Before my minions capture the cities, my tanks flatten the earth, and my cruisers cast a net around space itself. This was amazing. How many times had he dreamed of sharing his vision with someone who would take him seriously? To recognize his brilliance from the surrounding dullards. Then I will step forward and reunite the world. Forged under one creed. The creed of Quidel. At last, all will finally... Quidel faltered. He'd imagined at this stage in the story, any listener would wear a look of fascination upon hearing his prophecy. But Billy had a completely calm expression, eyes sliding off to look elsewhere. Perhaps even in a bored fashion? No, not possible. This man knew his name, had heard of his accomplishments. He must have been shielding his true dread. Finally, all will be equal. All will prosper under me as their benevolent leader. And since you have approached me with kind words, I will give you a chance. Join me, the first of my followers, and I will let you watch the evolution of the world from a prime position under my care. Quirrell took in a well-earned breath. His speech had gone magnificently. You dumb big man. I can say someone likes the sound of our own voice. But, mockery, derision, where was the awestruck perception he'd pictured so many times in his head? Billy glanced at his gauntlet. Do you want to know something, Quidel, talker of shite? He looked up and placed a hand on Quidel's shoulder. He felt ready to collapse under its weight. Usually, a man has to accomplish something before he's able to boast, but I don't think you can do even that. Billy leaned close and spoke right into his ear. You're a dirtbag, Quadell. A delusional, stupid dirtbag. That's it. You're not even worthy of a good fucking swear word. And by the way, you've already risen. Far as you'll ever go. Enjoy the top while you can. Billy squeezed Quidel's shoulder for a brief second, thumb and forefinger forming a hard pincer with surprising strength. Then he let go and was gone, down the stairs and away, as quickly as he'd appeared. Had that really just happened? Quidel stood there in a daze. A buzzing on his gauntlet pulled him out. His team. They were still looking for the girl. He'd completely forgot. He opened his gauntlet to see who was calling. Bit back a tear.
Amelia slipped under a low awning attached to an egg-shaped van and clambered through a circle of empty plastic chairs arranged around a tacky table. Tumbled onto an alleyway, or maybe better to say a thin strip of empty space between the parked vehicles and their decorations of canvas and wooden boarding. Of course, Sawtooth's goons were here. She'd been stupid not to expect them. She had to outrun the pack now and work out the rest later. A stench hung around this place, one that proved not everyone bothered going down to the ground floor to use the apartment's toilets. A few people walked along the strip in a slow, detached, floaty way Amelia wasn't familiar with. It was dark amongst the jumble of immovable makeshift walls, trapping her in a maze of shadows and filth. She stared about with wide eyes, head throbbing with every beat of her racing heart. The joy she'd experienced earlier had disappeared very quickly, as it usually did. She'd been somewhere familiar on this floor of the apartments before, on a mission at night time. She'd preferred it then, the interior lighting of the vehicles and the strings of light bulbs hanging between the trucks gave everything a buzzing, yellow atmosphere. Now the bulbs stayed dead, swinging their own shade onto the grubby floor. Amelia's head continued to pound, the lack of water clawing at her throat. Heat radiated from the sunburns, the bruised eye stung, her hair stank, and the top and shorts were scratched all over, stiff and crusty from days of built-up dried sweat. Her stomach clenched in protest, and at that moment she glimpsed three sets of dinner plate eyes, belonging to a trio of thin children draped in ill-fitting rags, staring at her from a bus doorway. All she felt towards them was jealousy. Dizzy. Amelia clutched her torso and staggered forward, of her hand trailing against a cold metal truck side, drifting through foul-smelling vapours and distant shouts. So numb. Or was she just sleepy? There you are. A hand wrapped itself around Amelia's upper arm and yanked her back with such force that her shoulder felt ready to pop out again. She was spun around and marched forward, rough hand tightly clutching her bicep. Amelia looked up and saw a trimmed beard and glasses floating above her. Sunglasses, despite how dark it was. Sunny. He dragged her onwards, past a van with all the windows smashed in and by a converted container. Amelia's tired feet nearly tripped over themselves as they were mercilessly told to keep up. Let me... Who gave you permission to speak? Sonny growled, refusing to slow the relentless pace. Do you know how much time I've wasted looking for you? I don't want to hear another word. Silenced. Muzzled. Back to normal. A few people glanced towards them as they walked. Outlines of their faces turned towards Amelia and her captor. Curious, but none stopped to ask questions. Amelia hadn't spent much time outside the rock in no man's land, and even she knew it was best for people to keep to their own business. Asking questions could prove fatal. Sonny tugged her into a clearing at the end of the strip, harsh sunlight filtering in through the chain-link fencing of the apartment's open walls. It was busier here, a constant flow of residents using the stairwell. There were paintings on this wall too, though not of peaceful, smiling men and women. Instead, three big figures were sketched against the flaking concrete wall, all with tiny bodies and ludicrously sized heads. The first man had a blue suit and a chalk-white, drooping face, every fold of skin sagged with wrinkles, layers of it covering his black-rimmed eyes and frowning mouth. The second was a lady in an orange suit with brown skin and massive pointed ears sticking out of a face containing wild, bloodshot eyes and fangs sprouting from the mouth. The final man between them wore a black uniform with red trimmings, face dominated by a vulture-like nose and tiny thin lips, cock-shaped scar scrawled across his stretchy neck. Above the heads were words, scrawled in angry, sharp lines. Sons of bitches. Sonny stopped next to the drawings and let go of Amelia to open his gauntlet. Quirrell, where are you? Not him! 
She took a cautious step away. The hand whipped to her arm like a viper, jerking Amelia back to its owner's side. Don't you dare. The sunglasses hid the eyes above Sonny's hard-set jaw. She could see her reflection staring back in the glasses. Dirty, scared and lost. A stray separated from its owner. Be a good little bitch and stay put. She felt the new desperation gripping her. Back in the men's grasp, all she could think about was getting away. She'd made it too far to end like this. Emilia cast her eyes about for clearing, seeking a different path. A young boy met her eye, lowered his head and hurried on. A gaggle of shabbily dressed women talked in hushed tones, huddled together and glancing her way, none leaving their protective circle. A man with tattoos covering his face leant against a pillar, smoking a cigarette, gazing at nothing in particular. A group of four older men sat on stools next to their truck, had lowered their playing cards and stared over at the commotion. Amelia clung on to their gaze, silently praying for a bigger reaction. Sonny's grip loosened, uncomfortable with all the attention. Hurry, Quadell, I'm by the eastern stairwell. How could you not know where that is, you fucking idiot? A tension filled the air, the same as when Saltif was about to give a sentencing in his chamber. Longer gaps between people's conversations, stiffer body movements, awkward glances. Still, no one moved. She'd have to do something other than stare. Could she risk saying anything out here? Was it possible for someone to overrule one of Saltif's own men? Help, she whispered, only loud enough for Sonny to hear. He immediately leant close. Shut up! He seethed into her ear, tightening his grip. That was all. No beating, no hitting. Help! Amelia shouted, her voice nearly cracked. She hadn't yelled in a long, long time. Help! Help me, please! We're going! Sonny pulled on her arm and started walking her back, the way they'd come. Just wait until we're back at the rock, you little... Wait up. What are you doing with her? None of your business, Sonny snapped back. I want to hear her answer. Sonny stopped, teeth gritted. He turned, painfully twisting Amelia around by the arm. How about you mind your own business before you make trouble for us? Are you all right? It was the tattooed man. He'd dropped his cigarette and squared his shoulders in the fashion Amelia recognised as a man preparing for a fight. She's fine. The tattooed man ignored Sonny and looked at Amelia, waiting for her answer. Weird being asked a question, but not a bad weird. She shook her head. You fucking... Sonny was cut off by the man's shove. He let go of Amelia's arm and stared at the tattooed man, mouth agape. One of Sawtooth's own had been pushed back. Now, the man said slowly, how about we... Fuck her! Sonny took off his glasses and flung them to the side. That only meant one thing. Amelia took her chance and dashed for the stairwell, passing the group of card players, advancing on the confrontation. She started to climb. On the third step, heard the first smack. Hawker ran up the stairs, hems of his flapping trench coat racing his legs to reach the top. Hush had fallen behind, the disfigured man was no distance runner, but Hawker wasn't lacking for company. A torrent of curious shoppers climbed the stairwell with him, towards the shouts and scrapes coming from the floor above. They wrestled with the stream of residents, running in the opposite direction, women and children bustled apart by the oncoming flow of bodies. The first floor was Sonny's responsibility. What on earth had he done? Hawker was in no doubt his crew were to blame for the ruckus. If not responsible for starting it, then definitely guilty of exacerbating it. Violent thugs, all of them. He rounded the corner, and before he could assess the situation, was pushed forward by the crowd into the bodily pandemonium. Spittle, sweat, and blood flew in the cramped space as men yelled and shouted, hurling fists wherever they could, aiming at no one in particular. 
Tents were trampled on, and vehicles shaken as people were thrown against their sides, leaving large dents. The cavernous layout of the floor gave every whack and scuffle a faraway noise that resounded under the returning screams and swears in the semi-darkness to make a second, invisible crowd, copying everyone's movements. Hawker was pinned in with the side participants, struggling to keep his head above the crowd, inhaling the stinking, sweat-damp air. He and the immediate people around jostled to keep away from the centre as they were hemmed in by more spectators joining the ring, like trying to avoid a violent mosh in the middle of a packed concert. No, even worse. Like the crush of an old arrival day shopping spree, except there were no bargains to be had here. Hawker remained calm, as calm as he could in the circumstances. He'd been in this situation before. Panicking only made it ten times worse. Punches and kicks were thrown all around, as the thin veneer of no man's land civilization slid away for a brief, liberating set of seconds. Most people hated their lot in life out here. Probably needed this kind of release, finding it worthwhile despite all the injuries it brought. Hawker told himself he wasn't one of them, just an innocent passerby caught in the madness. Wasn't on their level. A floppy-haired man advanced towards him, looking at random for someone to hit, and Hawker had made the cut. The man locked eyes and neared as Hawker wrestled his fist up from his side, the other pinned against someone, unsure how to defend himself with only one free arm. The man yelled something incoherent under the cacophony of profanities. Hawker yelled back, making sure not to swear, annoyed at the injustice of it all. Buzz off! A sudden surge from behind, some unseen jerk of the social beast, made the whole crowd push forward in a wave. He flailed his arm, felt the elbow connect with the floppy-haired man's face. The man crumpled to the floor, where he was subjected to a herd of stampeding boots. Whatever caused the surge from behind Hawker, he was certain he'd never find out what, began to recede, allowing him to regain his footing. What a mess. The crowd had taken on a personality of its own during the frenzy, but now people were withdrawing. Older and more sensible fighters who'd had their curiosity for violence sated trickled out of the area. Hawker stayed behind, hovering at the edge of the trampled clearing, where the main bulk of fighting was still in full swing. Someone had thrown a monoblock chair into the crowd, and it hopped above the shouting heads, being whacked over and over by stray hands, like a balloon at a children's party. Someone grabbed the chair's leg mid-air and flung it to the side, bashing it into an unfortunate woman standing next to Hawker. He stooped and caught the shocked woman, passing her on to her friends gathering around, and turned back to the crowd, as if nothing more than a slight case of fainting had occurred. He spotted Sonny with blood spilling from a cut in his eyebrow to cover half his face. No sunglasses. Someone must have really pissed him off. He was throwing punches and definitely swearing obscenities, although Hawker couldn't hear him. The noise had somehow gotten worse, the new empty spaces left by the dwindling crowd, allowing more room for each smack and yell to bounce and clap with one another, competing to be the most unsettling sound possible. For there was no way for Hawker to get to Sonny, still in the middle of the thriving mall. He saw Quidel, for once a comforting sight, amidst the uproar. He too was circling the crowd to avoid the packed-in brawling. Hawker had once sold a pair of steel-capped boots to Quidel for double the going rate by swapping the labels from safety construction wear to a homemade Supreme Warrior tag. Had been a proud moment for Hawker. He didn't feel so proud now, as he saw those same boots planting vicious kicks into loose legs and hips, hopping back before their victims had a chance to retaliate. Quidel! He shouted, handling aside a bloody tattooed man who'd been pushed into him. Quirrell turned, revealing a set of red-shot puffy eyes. Hawker held back from asking what happened. Obviously, Quirrell had received a blow to the face. What is it? Quirrell asked, a quiver in his voice. Must have been a big hit. Where's the girl? Girl? I don't know. Quidel looked about him, as if he expected her to be magically standing next to them. Shit. I don't know. Hawker looked back at the clobbering. 
Sonny had finished his latest clash and was scanning the crowd, dazedly looking for his next sparring partner in a pointless rage. So much for choosing when to pick your battles. Sonny! Sonny! Hawker yelled, struggling to make himself heard over the discordant shouting. Sonny gazed over, blinking the blood out of his eyes. He must have spotted him, or more likely Quidel's yellow mohawk, because he raised a finger and pointed upwards, directly above his head. At least someone was quick on the uptake. Hawker opened the gauntlet and called Firecrotch. The girls ran to the second floor. Help, Rammer! Kidnap her? Didn't sound right when he put it into words. Help get her! A large presence shifted behind him, and Hawker turned to see a huge blonde man, the same from that morning, move towards the stairs. Even someone that big couldn't see the appeal in the mindless bloodshed. Sonny had already turned back to fight in the increasingly ugly squabble, where every remaining participant was covered in their fair share of splattered blood. Quirrell stood to the side, fists clenching and unclenching. Risen! Risen! I am far from risen! Seemed yet another screw had been knocked loose in his head. Come on, Hawker said, elbowing the muttering man. Do you want to let her... escape? That didn't sound right either. Quidel blinked, clearing the wetness from his eyes. No, no, let's go. Hawker and Quidel turned, right into the flourishing front of Jorge's belly. Ah, not good. Not good at all. You again? The head of security turned his moustache to Quidel. And you? Why am I not surprised? A file of white-shirted guards began to stream in from the stairs, whistles screeching and battens out to decorate a few more heads with grisly wounds. Fine mess you've caused. We practically have a riot on our hands. Why me? All Hawker had wanted from the sighting was a chance to make a bit of cash and get rid of some junk in the process. Now, being stuck with an abundance of dodgy thermal scopes seemed the least of his problems. It wasn't us. Hawker replied, copying the same upheld hand gesture from ten minutes ago. We just arrived to see what the fuss was about. Quidel didn't chime in, mercifully quiet for once. Hmm. Jorge glanced over at the crowd, slowly stroking his moustache as three guards ganged up on a skinhead, beating apart his weak defence of cringing arms and twisted legs. He one of yours? Sonny was being dragged out of the crowd and across the floor by two guards. I swear he walked in with you lot. Hawker squinted to make sure. Out cold. Nope. He just happened to be next to us in line. Hmm. Anyways, we best be heading. Get out of your hair. Again. Heh. <laughs> His weak chuckle went unaccompanied. You're not going anywhere. No one is until everyone's been dealt with. As he spoke, a second set of guards began to arrive, ushering drug addicts out of the dark corners of the stairwell and onto the floor, sealing the floor's exits and trapping fighters and onlookers alike. Looked like they were going to be stuck here a while. Jorge shot Hawker and Quidel another suspicious look. Opened his gauntlet. On his first week in the job, Ronald tried to keep a tally of people leaving the apartments. It only made sense to have a running total of both entries and exits from the premises, allowing for an overall picture of the number inside. It had never been a responsibility assigned to him. Like so much of his role, he had taken on the task without being asked. He had given up after a week, because of occasions exactly like this one. A swarm of wounded fighters limped and shuffled through the exit gate, and the river of people leaving at least five thick, made it impossible for Ronald to single-handedly count them. There was a medical tent on the underground floor of the apartments, next to the bar and betting ring, but it was small and ill-equipped for this many people. The injured were departing for the hospital nestled in the abandoned office block across the desert square. Private, fee-charging, and of course, heavily guarded. Have a good one, Ronald! Ronald straightened his glasses and saw the goateed man, Jorge's friend from earlier, waving at him. He'd forgotten his name. 
Ronald raised his hand in a stiff farewell to the man who had a beaming smile despite the groaning men and women surrounding him. His gauntlet buzzed a second later. Ronald! came Jorge's voice, set to the background track of cursing, scuffling, and the kind of commotion he liked to avoid. We've got fights spreading to the other floors here. Put everything in lockdown immediately. Okay. Ronald hung up and hit the appropriate button. Noted the time in the incident log. 12.27. Alarms blared and red rotating lights began to flash as the gates were lowered. Jorge's goateed friend, the one responsible for the fireworks, was one of the last people to slip out of the exit as it was sealed. Ronald ignored the protesting shouts from both sides of the gate and flicked a few pages back in his incident log. Impressive. Only the second emergency lockdown this month. The sirens in the ceiling screamed, each wailing for attention, echoes crying for more. The noise came in waves, making Amelia's head shudder with each pass. She shoved her fingers in her ears, trying to give her pounding skull some peace. It didn't work. Ghostly shadows floated by, spilling into the rotting cardboard shacks and meagre tents that inhabited this level, running from the floor that continuously swayed to either side. The apartments were trying to move, rip themselves from their foundations and away from the alarms, tearing its insides apart. That was certainly what she wanted to do. She'd come looking for freedom, the gateway to Shankmora, and an escape from this life. Instead, she'd find a swirling labyrinth of chaos, even worse than the savage desert engulfing it. The noise stopped, so suddenly that Amelia nearly tripped over her feet in surprise. Or maybe that was because of how exhausted she was. She took a deep breath of damp air through sun-raw nostrils, unplugged her ears as the world became solid and still again. She'd never been so relieved for the sound of silence, quiet except for children's cries and whistles screeches on the floor below. Whistles. It had been years since she'd heard their shrill song. Where had she used to listen to them? Football. During games on the street, when an eager kid brought props to play as referee. Back before the sickness and the protest started. Before the streets shut and the shooting began. Maybe she should go downstairs and play with them. One last game. No, she had to keep going. Had to get to Shankmora and find the free woman and discover their secrets. She needed to find another chai lady to help her. But as she looked around, Amelia realised there were no ladies selling chai. There were no ladies or men at all. The floating figures had all made it back to their lairs, and an eerie quiet settled. Surrounded by distant noise from both above and below, the gap between the tents only seemed more deserted. Laundry hung on lines overhead, crowding the space above with whole-torn shirts, frayed trousers and yellowing sheets. No wind passed to rustle the motionless fabrics. The backpack was getting heavier. Amelia pulled it off. She winced as her blaster pistol inside whacked against the thin, soiled cardboard covering the concrete floor. She'd put it there after running from Sunny to save the weight on her hips. Her hair swung in front of her face as she bent down and a dirty clump of twisted strands tried to crawl into her mouth. She flung the hair back, flopping the greasy heap against her back, unzipped the bag and pulled out the remaining near-empty water bottle. Even that was heavy. She gulped the last of the sour water. Couldn't tell if it brought any relief. So numb. She bent to return her empty bottle. Footsteps. Fast ones. Running. Amelia looked up. A head was popping in and out between the curtains of washing. A bald, black one. Rammer. He was coming towards her, face turned over the tops of the tents. A bad man. A very bad man. She still remembered the night he'd cornered Amelia during a feast. 
had drunkenly grabbed both her arms, hungry smiles spread wide and evil. Men dragged him away, growling how Saltif could never find out about his touches. That was Saltif's power, utterly feared by others, and she'd abandoned it. Amelia shuffled backwards down the strip, as quiet as possible, back bent and dragging her pack on the floor. Where to hide? She could tell she was thinking slow, hoping her feet would be faster than her head. A blue one-man tent sat open to the side, snapped pole giving it a lopsided shape. She pushed back the hanging flap. A set of discoloured cotton blankets were the only occupants. She hurled her backpack in, not caring any more about its clunking protests, and crawled after it, pushing the flap back into place to cover as much of the yawning hole as possible. She lay there, feet and eyes pointed towards the entrance, heart beating, breathing too hard. The tent was stifling, a shrinking blue coffin that jot closer and closer to suffocating her as Rammer's footsteps neared. She heard him running nearby, slowing down. Amelia clutched her pack to her chest, ready to throw it, sat stone still, trapped in the stench of soggy blanket. Another set of footsteps, coming from the opposite direction, crossing Rammer's path. Was another man with tattoos coming to help? She should have stayed downstairs, the first person in this place to help her, and she'd run away like an idiot. Any luck? That voice! Amelia held a hand over her mouth, muffling the scream that wanted to rip out of her throat into a faint whimper. Tears brimmed in her eyes, chest jerking with silent sobs. She hadn't thought it could get any worse. Fire crotch, right outside the tent. Him and Rammer, two of Sawtooth's worst. Fire Crotch never approached her as directly as Rammer, but she wasn't stupid. She'd seen his stares, heard the comments to his friends when passing her. Fire Crotch had been sinister enough when Sawtooth was nearby, his iron cast law stopping any foul acts against her. Now Sawtooth and his rules were far, far away. Not a thing, Rammer said, almost singing the words. You? What do you think? Firecrotch snarled back. Waste of my fucking time this is. Like your time is valuable. Rammer's horrible, echoey laugh followed his own comments. Besides, how often do you get a chance at Sawtooth's golden girl? What I would do to his Amelia if I found her. He'd said Amelia, her name, even though he was forbidden from it. You're right there. Best not to waste a chance of that hot little ass. She wished the both of them would please die. Amelia felt herself tremoring, like those cold winter nights amongst the frost in the rock. Wished she was there right now. Tell you what, let's have a bet. First to find the girl gets twenty toss coin. Rammer chuckled, a deep, wretched cackling. Twenty toss coin and Amelia? I can hardly wait. Well, go on then. Get hunting. Yeah, yeah. A shadow flickered over the tent, and Amelia shrank away from it like it was a boiling truck engine coasting by. She waited. Waited until there were no more steps. If only she were more awake and able to think. Then she could move. But where to? And how without anyone noticing? And why did only one set of footsteps walk? The tent's flap jumped back and Amelia screamed. Her voice broke halfway through the cry as Firecrotch stuck his head through the entrance, wide smile splitting his face. Twenty toss coin for me, he said, rare glee seeping into his words. You have no idea how long I've been waiting for this day, you naughty slut. Amelia threw her pack, muscles burning from the simple action. Firecrotch shoved a hand through the entrance and batted the bag away like it was nothing more than a pesky fly. Ha! That's it. Keep struggling, girl. No one likes a quitter. 
Firecrotch's other pale hand crawled through the flap and clutched her leg. She winced as the rough fingers dug into her calf and dragged her across the floor, pulling dirty bundles of blanket with her. She raised her right arm and took aim at the floating ginger head, bobbing and changing size. Through her clenched fist, Firecrotch's free hand caught it and wrapped itself around hers. He crawled halfway into the tent and his hand slivered from her fist to her arm, started to tow. He slid her underneath him, frowning at her kicks and cries. Amelia flailed against him, but all she hit were firm muscles, met by a set of eyes that showed he was nowhere close to being tired. The sounds outside the tent seemed to muffle. The world shrank to just her, the ragged tent and fire crutch. A miniature hell. Now, now, girl. Fire crutch's spittle landed onto her cheek. You should know that fighting only gets me more excited. Give me your best shot. Come on. He had clambered on top of her, arse sticking out of the tent, legs and arms pinning hers against the floor. She strained her torso, thrusting her hips and chest. She might as well have tried shifting a car. So tired, couldn't move. This couldn't be real. That's not enough, Amelia. Fire Crotch pelted her with sharp breath as he leant closer and whispered. Is that all sort of best girls got on off? Amelia butted her head, aiming for Fire Crotch's chin. He saw the movement and pulled back. Her forehead met empty space, whiplashed to the floor. Had the back of her head hit him? No, that didn't make sense. He was above, and she beneath, and underneath her was... Ah. Her head had smacked the flimsy plastic floor covering the concrete. A distant chuckle clawed at her ears. That was your final push, eh? Good effort, girl. Although I would be careful, that looked painful. Now don't worry. It'll hurt at first, but it always does the first time. You'll learn to love it, and then me. Amelia screamed, tried to scream. Maybe managed to sob. Why bother? Sawtooth wasn't nearby to help against his disgusting minions. The further she ran from him, the more danger she found. She'd had it so good before. Never should have left. How stupid. How selfish. Her limbs were numb. Her attacker could tell. He lifted an arm and grabbed her chin, tilting it towards his. The flaring nose, clogged pores, and widened eyes filled her vision, and she knew then this would be a face that scarred her nightmares. Another to add to the pile. Maybe Firecrotch had already violated her, and this was a dream, a memory of an event she'd no power to change. What else could explain how unreal it all felt? Life shouldn't be this hard. Only one thing left to do. She burrowed and wrapped herself in the shell, the strongest she could muster. Tried to curl into a ball like she normally did, burying her glazed eyes into scratched knees. Couldn't because of the man atop her. Bet you regret running now. Firecrotch's face swam closer. Closer. A white squid caught it. Tentacles stretching across the lips and curling around the nose and eyebrows. The tendrils bulged and the image began to shrink as Firecrotch's face was pulled towards the surface. Another squid joined its partner and clutched onto the back of Firecrotch's head, tentacles coiling amongst his ginger hair. No, not tentacles. Fingers attached to a pair of massive hands. A huge silhouette loomed outside the tent, towering above the both of them. Firecrotch's shocked expression flashed by Amelia's side vision. The floor shuddered as a spatter of blood landed atop the spittle on her cheek. The image at the side of her eyes moved up and down with big, jerky motions. What was that word? Firecrotch's leaky face flashed by, 
much darker and shinier this time. It thudded against the floor. She didn't look to her side, just stared up. And again, it whipped by her peripheral vision. Again. No, not peripheral. Some other word. All the commotion was interrupting her concentration. The movement to her side stopped, and she was vaguely aware of pressure releasing from her body as Firecrotch rolled to the side, left a sticky trail behind him. Amelia! Amelia! Who was shouting? So much noise, but it was hard to make it out. Where was Firecrotch? Where was she? Are you okay? Amelia! Someone was using her name. A blue eye. Sawtooth had arrived. He'd saved her. He really did care. She suddenly remembered something very important. Smiled. Or maybe she was too tired to. Periphery. What? The words, periphery vision. She closed her eyes. Let mind spin away from body. Hawker was tired of waiting and fretting, especially after the morning he'd had at the apartment's entrance. So he took a wander around the bloodied clearing where the scrapping had finally ended and the guilty culprits were getting a handcuffing by security. Unfortunate day for whoever lived in the wretched, destroyed tents sprouting from the sides of the vehicles around the clearing. He absent-mindedly gave the graffiti next to the stairwell a look over. A lot of the residents had an artistic side to them, and the drawings on the wall got covered over every few days by new layers of paint, chalk and crayon. Every time he came back, there was something different on these walls, and this time was no exception. Someone had stenciled and sprayed in three grossly oversized caricatures of the main faction leaders. No complimentary features to be found on these monstrously disproportioned depictions. Unsurprising, considering street artists' universal hatred for the political elite. Although, Hawker had to admit, there was little to like about these three particular figureheads. A phrase was written above their oafish portrayals, although it meant nothing to him. Universal translators were implanted in the ears. They couldn't convert written words, although he guessed that Hios de puta meant nothing good. He moved on from the sketching and saw a stray guard blockading the stairwell. Hawker couldn't let the opportunity pass and was soon halfway through a sales pitch with the man. I mean, iron sights are a fine work for inside the apartment, but what about when outsiders attack? You, stuck behind the well-lit gate? Them, hiding amongst the dark alleyways across the square, taking their leisurely time to pick you and your buddies off. I bet by then you'd be praying for a high-quality thermal scope. The guard pursed his lips, glanced over his shoulder. How much? Oi, what are you doing? Hawker stuffed the scope into a pocket on his unbruised side. Nothing, pal. Just discussing the weather. Aha, uh -huh, Jorge said shoving his big gut between Hawker and the guard. Not selling any of your crap wares to my men who, I optimistically say, are on duty. How did he find out my wares are crap? Never. I wouldn't put making a profit ahead of breaking the rules. Hmm. Seems I'm surrounded by nothing but angels in here, Jorge said as he stepped aside for an especially bloodied man being carried by on a stretcher. To give them credit, the fighting had crumbled away within a minute of the guards storming the floor, exhausted boxers fleeing from the unleashed brutality of the security team, who Hawker guessed had weeks of pent-up aggression from standing on dull, endless shifts. Either that, or the sudden anarchy had provided humanity a chance to show its true face. Maybe a face interested in buying riot shields? He'd have to see if he could get a hold of some. Seems the fun's over for today, Jorge said as the last culprits were led from the trampled site. You're free to go. Free to go? You're not going to kick us out? Jorge snorted. If we start kicking out shifty operators like yourself, we'd have no business left. 
he sauntered off and, to Hawker's dismay, went up the nearest set of stairs. He waited until Jorge and the rest of his team's sweaty backs disappeared before hurrying over to Quidel. He was staring out of the apartment's fenced wall, smoking a cigarette. The leather jacket was ruffled and his mohawk skewed to one side of his head. He'd never seen Quidel smoke. Must have plucked a pack of cigarettes from the debris of lost possessions on the floor. Quidel, stairs are free. Let's take the far set to avoid the guards. Quidel glanced Hawker's way, then dropped his cigarette, crushed it under boot. Let's go. Call the others and see what's happening. Perplexing. No bragging. No noticeable muttering. Quidel was never so brisk. Maybe another screw had been knocked back into place. Hawker opened his gauntlet as they walked by nervous young children, glancing out of their thin-walled bedrooms. The older kids had already made their way to the scene of the crime, pilfering for lost loot. FC, Hawker said. Even fire crotch was too much an obscenity for his liking. No response. He tried Rammer next. What's happening up there? Hawker asked when Rammer picked up. Not much. No girl, and fire crotch has stopped responding. He's not responding. That's not much. All right, fucking mother. Vulgar Brit. Where'd you last see him? Hawker was getting sick of running in his heavy trench coat as he and Codell dashed up a deserted set of stairs and split to search the area Rammer had indicated. Hawker's footsteps seemed much louder here, in this quiet, dimly lit corner of the floor, clustered with ragged-looking tents, unenthusiastically washed laundry, and even worse-off occupants picking their way between threadbare guy ropes. The narrow laneway was suffocating, and Hawker pinched his nose as he delved deeper into the pit of living quarters. The floor below was a paradise compared to this. He scanned the ground as he walked. There wasn't much visible concrete beneath the layers of litter and cardboard. Something sticking out of a blue tent caught his eye. As he closed in, Hawker recognised the set of shoes he'd sold, Firecrotch. Not big, clunky things like Quidel's, but lightweight sandals, suitable for the desert's environment. They lay across half the alley, toes reaching for the sky, with those hoop-and-loop fasteners. The type of fastener that attested to the power of marketing. Hawker had never met anyone who didn't use the old, trademarked name Velcro for those kinds of fastener. The APOC may have killed off nations and millennia-long dynasties, but the subliminal brand recognition of jacuzzis, bubble wrap and post-it notes were a wholeheartedly stronger beast to tackle. He rushed to the entrance of the tent and pulled back the flap, resisted the urge to pull back with it. Firecrotch's body was there all right, but his head seemed to have been spread across the floor, condiment on toast style. Hawker swallowed, forcing the bile back into his stomach. Weak bellies made for weak business, and life after the APOC had given him plenty of training for this sort of thing. Still, it was tough to take in the blood and brain matter seeping out of the cracked bone that he was certain, based on placement alone, used to be a skull. Someone had introduced Firecrotch's face to the concrete multiple times, and it seemed the floor had come out on top of negotiations. Did the attacker really have to turn Firecrotch onto his back when he was done? Hawker could have lived without seeing the head's contents. Hush called! Quirrell had doubled back to find him. A lot of the guards are headed to the roof. Is that Firecrotch? What shape is he in? Hawker had never seen a deader man in all his life. Not great, but he might be okay. I'll keep an eye on him. You go ahead and see what's happening. Shit, all right. Quirrell ran on. Hawker waited. Then he started digging through Firecrotch's pockets, glad their contents had avoided the gore spattered about the tent. No point being respectful to this particular corpse. Firecrotch had never been nasty to Hawker, but he'd still given him the creeps, and the rumours of what the man got up to in his spare time weren't hard to believe. Besides, Firecrotch still owed him 35 toss coin, and there was no way Hawker was letting something like death stand between him and his debts. Floating. Floating some more. 
carried through the air by a mysterious force. She was human no longer, only a bundle of thought, gazing at the blurry realm of light and shadow sliding by. Shifting, shifting some more. Heat, a light breeze, voices, all in a separate world. She didn't know what was happening, didn't care. She was tired of running and fighting, tired of thinking and struggling, tired of surviving. Why resist when it's so much easier to do what you're told? She'd do anything Sawtooth asked, without question or hesitation, like he'd always wanted, so long as she got some rest. She'd trade the world, her entire existence, just for a chance to sleep. Quinnell gazed at Amelia's sleeping form, curled up in his arms, head nestled against the blonde man's massive chest. He carried Amelia towards the landing gunship, bombarded by blazing sunlight, deep, contrasting shadows cast beneath it. Quinnell could only stare, trapped behind the chain-link fence, topped with concertina wire that separated the worst-off residents, those exposed to the full force of the elements, from the landing pads and generators that filled the other half of the roof. I don't get it, one man commented to the woman next to him, a few steps away from Cordell and the other onlookers. Why is that insurgency gunship landing here and making such a racket? I thought it was only traders allowed up here, but that sure ain't a cargo ship, eh? Isn't it obvious, dear? It's one of the freelancers' stolen ships. They must have bribed the guards. Quinnell closed his eyes and concentrated on the accents, calling on ancient memories. Bribes? How about that, eh? Canadians. From before the epoch, when Canada was still a country. When countries were still a thing. That had been the first time in years he'd concentrated on such details. Looks like the big guy with the moustache is in charge. You should make friends with him. The man snorted. Why bother? We've already got everything we could ever need. Ain't that right? A replying sigh from the woman. So true, honey. The last sentence. It hadn't been honest. A heavy sense of irony had been placed on it. Another detail he hadn't thought about in years. What was wrong with him today? He was focusing on too much nonsense, starting to hurt his head. That must be the rich man now. Quinnell looked in the direction the couple indicated. The fat security guard, the one who'd stolen from him. He shook hands and joked with the man who'd just stepped out of the gunship. It was him. The man with the stupid tourist shirt and beard. Quidel felt his teeth grit together, the skin around his eyes tighten. Billy, that liar. He hated him, everything about him. His accent, his rudeness, his lies. Liar. Already risen, not possible. Lies, all of it. He was jealous, that liar. Liar, 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 liar. Who's a liar? Quinnell didn't respond to the Canadian man. He chewed his bottom lip and started clenching and unclenching his fists, giving him something to focus on and stop his accidental muttering. And now Amelia was being carried past Billy, the liar, in the blonde man's arms and through the gunship's doors, all of them oblivious to Quidel's boiling rage. So they'd been after her this whole time? Had that bastard Billy been trying to distract him? Get into his head? As if that would ever work. Never. Not against him. Never. Never. Never? What do you mean, never? What's wrong with you? Honey, don't. The woman, falsely thinking her whisperings were going unheard. He's not right in the head. He should be hitting that man for insulting him. Beat the woman for her mockery. So why wasn't he... Quidel stood there, biting his lip and staring at the gunship's shutting doors, engines accelerating. Leaving with Amelia, Sawtooth's favourite, the best, escaping again. How? The plan had been perfect, hadn't it? 
The black gunship slowly turned in the air and tucked its legs underneath itself, tilting its four engines sideways. It pushed off through the sky and towards the distant sea, the opposite direction from the rock where Saltif would be waiting for Quidel to personally report to him. Quidel felt a tear roll down his cheek. His second cry of the day. He took out another crumpled cigarette and put it between his lips. His second cigarette of the last five years. The world gently hummed, a constant purr in the background like a nearby fridge. One that actually worked. She'd missed that kind of continuous, predictable sound. The world was also tilting, ever so slightly, from side to side, the soft motions rocking Amelia awake. She lay on something hard, with a blanket on top, which reached around and swaddled her, so tight that her sleepy arms could barely move from its embrace. She twitched her nose, numb from the chilly air. The only place this cold was the depths of Sawtooth's rock, although why would it be moving around like this? She should open her eyes, but didn't want to. Then life would resume, and this slice of peace would be over. She'd woken without any sighs, small yawns, or stretches, which she used to do in the morning without realising. She'd trained herself, consciously and not, to be as still as possible when waking. To act like a wooden board sitting overlooked in the corner. Anything for a few more moments to go unnoticed. A creaking hinge, a swishing through the air, and a small shift of pressure. A door opening. Lord Almighty, this is a fine mess. Amelia lay still, hoping the owner of the voice wasn't talking to her. How many alliance we talking? Where had she heard that strange voice before? It wasn't any of Saltiff's men. She'd recognise them instantly. Just a gunship? That can't be. There's always more than that. Here, Jorge told me an Alliance cruiser was spotted in the area not too long ago. Give you a bet on where it's headed. It was that man. The one with the weird shirt and accent. What was he doing here? She slowly opened her eyes, curiosity overwhelming her urge to be left alone. There was no dirt or sand, no stones and no red. Not a hint of anything normal except for the yellow lights illuminating the humming room in a soft glow. There was a bench, made from sheening metal like everything else, built right into the wall. She must have been lying on an identical one on her side of the room. A set of what looked like giant hangers hung from the ceiling, swaying and clinking against one another, trapped like her inside the tiny metal space. It was how she imagined the inside of her shell looked, cool and unfeeling, but also hard and tough, impossible for outsiders to break into. Except there were two intruders inside the shell, the two men from the desert. She glimpsed the next room, clouds whipping by a darkened square of window before the door closed off the sight. Flying. She must be inside the men's ship. The black one, with the large engines and claw-like legs. Actually flying. She hadn't even noticed. All right, Tonkai, we'll try not to burn the place down before we come back. The bearded man topped on his gauntlets, pacing up and down between the benches, shorts level with Amelia. A cold panic gripped her for a moment before she spotted her backpack on the bench opposite her the bulge of the blaster pistol inside obvious. The blonde man sat next to it. He was looking at the floor, sad, creased lines in his face. He looked up at Amelia and saw the lines continuing into his eyes. Blue eyes. It hadn't been Sawtooth who'd saved her from Firecrotch. It had been this man. The man opened his mouth to speak, closed it, stared at the floor again. Why did he refuse to talk to her, even after saving her, unless he hadn't really wanted to do it? You up? The man with the goatee had finished talking on his gauntlet. Have to say, 
you're looking a lot worse for wear from when we last saw you, and that was already bad enough. He plonked himself down on the bench, next to the much larger man. You had us scared for a while there. Didn't think Saltif's boys would be coming to get you that quickly. Nearly did too. Good thing Oscar found you when he did. He patted the big man, Oscar, on the back. Got anything to say to her? The man who'd smashed in Firecrutch's head stayed quiet, the same as before. Maybe she could risk speaking. You're not with Saltif? She shrank back slightly as Oscar gave her a fierce stare. The bearded man screwed up his face. Course not. Do we look like we're with Saltif? You don't, Amelia said, pointing towards his flower shirt. She felt herself smiling, able to put thought into words, to say those words to others, to just talk. I'll take that as a compliment. Who? The words croaked out of Amelia's throat as she coughed up the rest of her question. Oscar handed her a bottle of water and she clawed at it, pulling out the stopper and gulping its contents. That's Oscar, and I'm Billy. Did I not tell you our names when we first met? Ugh, goes to show how different conversations are when they're one-sided. Amelia wrestled free of the blanket and pushed up straight to get a better drink from the bottle, barely listening to Billy's words. Well, at least you're talking to us now. Amelia lowered the bottle, suddenly remembering something. I didn't kill Rusk. I just hit him. Why'd you hit him? Billy asked, his smile dropping. He was going to get you out of that place. So he'd been the one to leave the door open. Amelia lowered her head, unable to meet the gaze. Leave her be. Oscar, talking for the first time. Rusk mustn't have had a chance to tell her in advance. She couldn't have known. Amelia glanced up, saw Billy give Oscar a sidelong glance and sigh. Well, if that's how it is, we'll have to help him later. He won't be coming back to the fort now. Fort? Amelia asked in a peep. Billy nodded. That's right. We're going to the jagged fort on prosperity. Prosperity? Isn't that a word? Aye, but it's also the name of an island, right in the middle of the Atlantic. The Alliance's old headquarters, actually. And now, it looks like they want it back. If you're a fan of the audiobook so far, then I have good news for you. I've decided to record and post the rest of the book up here on YouTube. However, I do have some bad news in that vein, and that is that it's going to take a long time to do that. I am still currently juggling a full-time job, as well as writing more books and learning another language all at the same time. So, it will get done, it just might take some time. So far, part one of Apocalypse Awakening is up on YouTube. The video you just heard is a short excerpt of what will be part two. I hope to get the whole rest of part two, which will probably be another seven or eight hours, out by summer. And part three, which will be the last and final part of the Apocalypse audiobook, sometime out in the months after that. I'm sorry it will take so long. I am, after all, just one man with a microphone. But if you really can't wait to get to the rest of the story, then the book is available on Amazon right now. I plan to have it available on other platforms in the future. Hopefully by summertime it will be distributed widely. But as of right now, it is only available on Amazon. That's the best way to support me and the series is to buy the book and leave, ideally, a good review. But if you think it's worthy of a mediocre or even bad review, then that's fair enough as well. Any feedback at all always helps me as a writer. So thank you very much for your patience and hopefully you'll be seeing the next video relatively soon.